This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by Athon Books. Check out the very best in science fiction and fantasy at athonbooks.com. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Serena Burdick on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's called Find Me in Havana, and uh, this is it, – it's a novel. It is a, a novelized – uh, telling of a of a real story and real characters, and uh, uh, this is such a fascinating book and such a fascinating look into a time that um, that we seem to be losing uh, a lot of perspective on. And uh, I, I think you're really going to enjoy this book. It definitely needs to be in your to be read pile. Uh, welcome to the show, Serena. Hi, Hank. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm I'm super excited to to get to chat about the new book today. Uh, but before we do, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's a good one. I my first memory of wanting to tell stories is very young, probably six or seven. I uh, went to a really unique elementary school where creative writing was part of the curriculum. So it was just sort of part of my childhood, but I never thought of doing it professionally or as something that would be out in the world that anyone would read until I was much older. I was about 28, 30 when I actually decided to abandon an acting career and, you know, just see what it was like to try to write a novel. (laughs) I love that. Um, were you a were you a bookish kid? Did, you know, were, were were you one of those kids that always had your nose in a story? I did. Yep, I was always had my nose in a story. I was an avid fan of all the Little House in the Prairie series. Um, I read them numerous times. I remember that was actually the first chapter book I learned to read. And I remember I had a friend. I was six, and my friend could read. And I just picked up the book and pretended I could read it and like was like <laughs> ran my finger over the words and chat and turned pages as if I could read it. And then I just remember one day like it clicked and I was reading it. And so that was um I was like a magical moment of discovering you could actually read chapter books. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I remember reading those. Excuse me, I keep bumping my headphones on my microphone. Um <laughs> I <laughs> I remember reading those little house books when I was a kid. I had a, a sister who was a year older than me and and you know I naturally got all of her hand-me-down books as she finished them she passed them to me. Uh, but it was not and and I and I loved them, but it was not until I had kids of my own and I reacquired that series of books and read them aloud to my kids that that I kind of uh you know, got lost in the story all over again and thought, you know, what, what genius storytelling these books are. They're, they're, uh, you know, f- fantasy in the, in the best sort of way that fantasy transports us to another place yet, uh, completely anchored in, in, uh, you know, our, our history. And, uh, it, it was such a fun experience to read them again as an adult. Yeah, I did the same with my kids. And it's fun now, too, because the world of, you know, books for young children has just blown oh, up yes. since I was a kid. So Absolutely. there's a lot of lot of choice out there. Um, I do love them because they're classic. And, you know, I was a big fan of Anne of Green Gables. And I gravitated more towards stories. And maybe that's why I write historical fiction now that were, you know, a lot of reality. Like, I love the fact in my world that Little House of the Prairie had really happened. Yeah. Um, that was a really great, I, and I never really was a kid that liked the fantasy books very much. Um, I remember I wasn't that into the line, the witch in the wardrobe or all those, what were fantasy availability yeah. back then. Um, so yeah, I, I liked the, the real telling of very like nitty gritty daily life. Love it. You, you mentioned acting and, uh, and, and I, I like to say graduating from acting to writing. Um, yeah. But, you know, I've had lots of guests on the show that 
have been involved in uh, in movies or TV or stage. And th- there's something about writing that that seems to scratch some of the itches that that go um, unattended to, uh, you know, from from acting or uh, some of these more collaborative art forms like like acting. You're taking someone else's story and you're bringing it to life uh, under the direction of a director, usually, uh, you know, and there, there are lots of people involved in the process, yet the writer until you are, you know, 80, 85 percent through the the process, it's it's solitary. You know, you, you still, you know, uh, work with an editor and a publisher usually. And, uh, you know, that becomes collaborative, but only at the end of the process um, did act did did writing um, help you to fulfill some of the things that you wish that you could get out of acting? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it's funny you should bring that up now because I've just been struggling with this idea that I am so solitary in my work now. And there was a time where I wasn't so solitary. Um, so to answer your first question, I, for me, the storytelling after many years of acting, I started to just feel sad that I wasn't able to you know, act things that I wanted to act in. And so storytelling came out of like, oh, what characters do I want to be? What stories do I want to tell that I don't get to tell when you're just sort of handed material? Right. Um, a lot of which isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at a point where I it actually dawned on me, I thought like, if I actually get cast in anything I've auditioned for, do I even want to do this? Like, this isn't actually even what I want to be acting in. Like, it's just like, So stories gave me this incredible sense of um, control that I had suddenly over my own storytelling. And um, that felt really empowering. But now at this stage, after many years, like 15 years of, you know, writing in this sort of solitary way, I'm actually really missing um, collaborating. Because it is true that at the point when you start to collaborate, you've already spent, you know, a year just in your own little head. <laughs> right. And I do love the collaboration once it begins. And editing is actually one of my favorite parts of the writing process. I just kind of eat that part up. I love it when I, I get notes back and I can dig in again and really like make it perfect the things that I've done. But I do really miss collaboration. I've actually been thinking about that lately and like how as a writer, I'm not very good at getting myself out there. I, mean, I don't have writers groups. I don't go to events and you know I'm not in school anymore so I've been really missing that sense of working on your craft with others during the process so I've actually been thinking about how I can do more of that I love that um to say that editing is is one of your favorite parts um that is not always a popular opinion with a lot of writers (laughs) some people really bristle at the idea of someone you know, reading their work and saying, mm, maybe, you know, could you try to do this or, or, or something like that? Um, I, was there ever a time where um, maybe it was uh, that you cared so deeply about a story that you couldn't see um, other suggestions or um, was this something that you've just always been open to? Like, like, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is if someone is struggling with the the collaborative effort of of editing and and having someone else you know speak into their work and 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 try to help you to see maybe a different perspective is, is, are there anything that any tools that you can use or anything like that that might help people to to like the editing process more yeah i so yeah when i'm editing on my own and you kind of get to just to me editing is two parts it's you know, honing your craft where you kind of get to go into your overall story and like make the words like pick and choose and you just get to get nitty gritty in a way that like I find very fun. Um, But then the other part of editing, when you have an editor telling you this works, this doesn't work, I've found that it, you just have to be very fluid and be, you know, willing to compromise, but also really clear on what you're not willing to compromise on. And so I try to balance that. I don't, I try not to ask, you know, I'll come across things and I'll feel prickly immediately. Like, oh no, you're telling me to take that part out, but then I'll keep going and I'll kind of like, I'll, I'll think about it. The, my instant reaction is always like, no, 
But then once you really think about it and you can see their perspective, you know, you may or may not decide that, okay, yes, I agree with this or I don't agree with this. And then it just, it does become a collaborative effort. So I'm very careful with what I choose to push back on because I don't want to be, I want to be open, but I also want to be really clear about what's important to me. And, and then I find that my editor is really wonderful about that. If I, you know, I'm not pushing back too much. So then when you get to say, when you're not that person that pushes back a lot and then, but there is something that's really important to you and you can say like, actually this part, I really want to leave it. Uh, I feel like your editor is much more likely to say like, okay, yes, you can leave that part because you're not asking for everything and you're just, you know, making sure. And, and it is interesting because I don't, I haven't had any instances where I have been asked to cut out like a major storyline or an entire chapter or character. Usually it's small enough things where it doesn't like feel too painful to take it out <laughs> or, or yeah. work it. Yeah. Authors. I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Dream Author by Sophie Hanna is an immersive 14-month coaching program for writers at any and every level of experience, and also for those of you who want to write and are just waiting for the right encouragement and guidance to get you started. Your writing dreams should make you happy. For so many of us, our dreams are not a source of happiness. Instead, they cause us stress, guilt, frustration, and even shame. Here's the great news. All of these feelings are natural and all writers experience them. The problem, though, is that when your writing dreams bring you more anxiety than joy, it affects your resolve and your productivity, and you end up not taking the action you need to take in order to propel your dreams in the right direction so that they can stand a strong chance of coming true. That's why Sophie created the Dream Author Coaching Program to teach anyone who is passionate about writing how to change the way they build, think about, and pursue their writing dreams in order to become their own most powerful ally and advocate for the rest of their writing life. And more great news. Once you've learned that skill, it lasts forever. Visit dreamauthorcoaching.com to get started today. Girl in the Afternoon, uh, that was your first book that you published, right? Yes. Yep. Was that your first book that you had written? No. <laughs> How did you know that? Do oh, all us writers I, have these first books? That you know, there, there, there are a lot of desk drawer or trunk novels uh, out there. You know that that, yeah. uh, that it's there's something about novel writing that that almost demands that you write something. And and learn the craft as you write. And uh, a lot of times, those are not the books that we publish. Um, what what was it that that drew you from from acting and 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 got you really wanting to work those muscles like like never before? Uh, you know, I went back to school. I just kind of couldn't take the acting industry anymore, and just needed to completely divert and go in another direction. So. 
I went back to Brooklyn College and just took English literature, just sort of like jumped into whenever I'd gone to school, other than theater, the thing that I always took for fun because I loved it was English and writing just um, because I enjoyed it, not because I had any plans to do anything with it. So when I went back to school, I was like, oh, that's the easy one. I'm going to check that box. I'm just going to go jump in and like do lots of reading and writing because that's fun for me. So I had no plans other than to just, you know, get my degree and enjoy what I was doing. And in that process with my professor in an independent study, I decided to tr to start a novel um, as part of my schoolwork. And that book actually ended up, after I graduated, I kept working it and that that ended up being the first novel that I've ever wrote. Um, and a funny story about that is I wrote that novel. That's the book that I ended up getting my agent with, but then she could never sell it. And meanwhile, while she was trying to sell that book, I wrote to girl in the afternoon, which ended up being the first book to sell. Um, and now 15 years later, the irony of the whole story is that I have just sold that first novel. <laughs> <laughs> I love so it. I, it will so, be my, it's so funny. It'll be my fourth book, but I've had to rework it so many times that it has actually become kind of a crazy experience. I, I, I love to hear that because uh, so many people have these novels that will never see the light of day. And I often wonder, uh, you know, are, are you just... Uh, do you just not want to put the work in to, to make that story, you know, um, marketable or, or whatever or... Um, you know, because I I, uh, I I like to think that I'm a, a pretty positive person. Um, like, is, is there nothing that that you can do to that story? To you know, it meant <laughs> something to you at one time, surely. Right. That, you know, yeah. So I, I'm I'm so happy to hear that. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I always loved the story. It was really passionate. To be honest, like I liked it more than Girl in the Afternoon. Or, um, you know, it was, and I always wondered if I liked it so much because it was like my first baby. And am I just holding on to this thing I shouldn't be holding on to because it's not actually really good? I never felt that it wasn't good. I just felt that for whatever reason, it wasn't the right fit for the right person at the right time, that it always kind of felt that way. Um, and so my agent also had never given up on the book. We just kind of shelved it. Like it was sort of a bit of a strategic move. She's like, this, let's not have this be your second book or let's just move forward and we'll see where it works down the road. Um, so it, and it's a lot of work to rework it. And I, and it, to be honest, I'm, I have reworked it so many times already <laughs> that this last time was a huge challenge. Cause I was definitely bored with it. It's like, Oh my God, do I really have to pull this book up again? <laughs> but then I, I get into it. I'm trying to, trying to, trying to find a light in it. <laughs> uh, I love when you're at the point where you're like, no one will ever care about this story. And invariably, <laughs> you know, when you've spent that much time on it, that's usually the one that people are like, this book changed my life. <laughs> you're like, what? So, uh, how? You know? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I do, it is true. And this is where, too, like, I was so happy to I recently, like, finished a first draft to send off to my editor. And I'm, like, very excited for a completely fresh opinion. She's never seen it. She doesn't know anything about it. Because I, because I need that fresh perspective because I have like absolutely no idea what works, what doesn't work anymore. Um, so, yeah. So Girl in the Afternoon, um, what what was it about the Franco-Prussian War that uh, that that, you know, called out to you? This is a story that needs to be told. You know, it's actually more that I wanted to tell the story of a, fem a female impressionist because there were a lot of really amazing female impressionists at that time. And it would always just stun me when no one's ever heard of them. Uh, so Bertha Morisot, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she was like as prolific and exceptional as, you know, Renoir or any of the others we've heard of a million times. Uh, and she never got any attention. So in writing that story was really more about, I said it in that time just because that's when um, Manet and the artists were, that was the year that I wanted to write about, and it happened to be during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, so it was like a good setting, but I really wanted to tell the story of like the woman's perspective of trying to be an artist in that era. The um, the Girl in the Afternoon, your first book, and then your second book, The Girls with No Names, and then the the book that we're talking about today, Find Me in Havana. Um, it, at first blush, seem to be, although they're they're all historical fiction, um, 
there doesn't seem to be a thread that connects these three other than, um, you know, these are historical tales that you, that you um, took some liberty with and, and, you know, found a great story in. Um, but do you, from your perspective and your vantage point, do you see a connection in, in these three books that you have published um, that, that we may not see on the surface? Um, so the first, not necessarily, well, it's interesting. The first two, the girl in the afternoon and the girls with no names. There is a character in the girls with no names. She is from France and she's 40 years old. And she is the th three-year-old daughter that we leave in the other book. So very oh. briefly, like her, she became a ballerina, but you don't know that in the other book. So she's this child that sort of a lot of drama unfolded around. And I don't know that anyone would pick that up and it doesn't even matter. Like you don't necessarily need to. I just think it's really fun when you throw, like you can make these little connections. Um, so I had one friend say like, oh my God, is that the daughter in the other book? I was like, yes, good call. You figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> but this book, Find Me in Havana, has nothing to do with anything that I have written in the past because this was like a true story um, that I had heard about many years ago and wanted to write. So that does not relate in any way. Um, to these. The, so the having, books. having those little connections, like you, like you talked about in, in the first two books, um, does that help you as a writer to envision your work in a kind of connected universe kind of way? Uh, and, and not that it has to, but do you, do you play those little, little games with your, um, your creations that, you know, oh, this connects in this way. And, uh, you know, even if it's just for your benefit. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really fun. I also have read other writers' books that do that, and I've and then you make the connection, and I always think that's really fun, even if it's just like a neighbor or someone that. And when that happens, it's like a little bit of a spark in the book process when, while you're reading, and I love that. So I thought of it from that point of view as the reader because I enjoy doing that. That's where it first came from. But then, to be honest, it actually is maybe a little bit of a lazy technique because then you already have the backstory of the character. You don't have to invent it. <laughs> so find me in Havana. Um, how did you stumble on this story? This, uh, you know, the more I dug into it, the more fascinated I was. One, um, we get this great look into the the Cuban Revolution and how, um, you know, how these these kind of big geopolitical events. Uh, affect individual people. And I think that's one of the great things about historical fiction is letting us look inside these uh, uh, these kind of boring events that you learn about in history class, because invariably, the farther away we get from an historical event, the more it just gets reduced to bullet points because there's just not enough time to, to give to every event. Um, but when you get to see that through a character, it really opens up and, and comes alive. Uh, what was it that first intrigued you about the story? Well, that aspect for sure. I loved the um, fact that she gets put into house arrest in Cuba and that her father was the chief of police for Batista um, right during the Castro revolution was just a, you know, to have that real life fact was exciting in and of itself. And then on top of it, she's already this Hollywood star. Um, I met her daughter 20 years ago and her daughter told me her mom's story sort of from beginning to end in one fell swoop. And it was, just too fascinating for me to not tuck away as something that I really wanted to either write. At the time I was in the midst of pursuing an acting career. So I had thought I would write it as a screenplay and kind of, I'd started the research back then many years ago and did write a screenplay and then I just abandoned it. Um, and then became a writer and had, you know, had that screenplay still lying around and decided it'd be a great thing to just turn into a novel. So. And, and her daughter's Nina. Yes, exactly. Her daughter's Nina. Who is one of the the viewpoint perspectives um, of of the narrative? Um, how, when when you realized that this needed to be told as a novel, um, kind of w w walk me through how that process came about. Like you, you you learned the story twenty years ago. You thought you might turn into a screenplay. Um, time goes on. When did it start becoming a novel in your mind? Around the time that I put out my first book, I had a dis like I had an idea of like, well, what do I want to do next? And that story was always there. And, you know, it wasn't quite right. I, I had the girls, the 
um, The Girls With No Names was the one that just sort of rose up and needed to be written first. So it had been there for a little while. And then I decided to re-interview Nina. I hadn't seen her in probably 15 years. So I reconnected with her and went uh, this time with the intention of interviewing her uh, with a recorder. So I heard the story at that point was being told to me from her perspective. And I, when I wrote the screenplay, it was just all about Estelina. It didn't really involve much of Nina. She came in and out. But then to hear the story being told to me from her, in her voice, from all of her experiences, it just seemed like a very natural way to tell the story. It was also from her side. And I liked the idea, you know, part of the story for me that was the most personal connection was the sort of tragic mother-daughter story. She always wanted something from her mother that she could never have. And then her mom like, dies in a very tragic way. So I wanted to, that felt like the heart of the book uh, and telling it from the mom's perspective as well as the daughter's perspective just felt like a natural way to do it. Um, most people who write historical novels don't have the benefit of having um, you know, at least one source that they can sit down and interview that that's amazing. Um, but since you did have this, uh, this, this source, uh, that you could get, uh, the story straight from what, what makes this a historical novel? Where does, where does your creative side come into the story? Yeah. When you're told things kind of like you were saying earlier about the sort of historical facts, just being regurgitated to you in yeah. this way, you don't have the depth of emotion or even the nitty gritty of a scene. So it was actually very challenging. I can't say to be honest with you that I fully loved <laughs> the process of trying to stick to someone's true story so accurately. I felt like I needed to because it was her story and I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to fictionalize a ton of it, but I also needed to make it a good story that would read like a novel and be entertaining. And so the timeline of someone's life isn't always that clear cut where it has like the natural arc of what you need a story to do. Um, so I had to change timelines. There's the beginning part where she is kidnapped by her father and brought to Mexico. It was the only real part that really happened in just that same way, but she was only one years old when it happened. And in my book, she's like 12. So, you know, all of her experiences as a 12 year old are fictionalized. Um, and then, you know, all the other things that really did happen as well, I had to just create emotion and dialogue and scene in a very different way than you do when you're just kind of telling facts of a story. So, and, and there are characters invented, some of them are invented. I've tried to keep most of them, like all of the main characters are who they are, but then, you know, you have, all of Estelita's husbands really were um, in the book, and she married all four of them, and they're all accurate. <laughs> but I, I <laughs> yeah. What to, what sort of research did you do to get into this this time and 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 place? Uh, you know, this is even though it's it's a uh, it's relatively uh, recent history. Um, we still are talking about you know the better part of a decade that's gone between. I mean, a century, not decade. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's true. I, um, you know, and the, for this, this, there were so many different aspects to it. There was Mexico, Cuba, and Hollywood. Um, so I just researched everyone very separately. I like dove into Hollywood life. I watched a lot of old Hollywood movies and read accounts of Hollywood actresses and written lots of, you know, biographies, autobiographies. That was like one part of the research. And then jumping into, you know, mostly I do most of my research through books and libraries. Um, then I also, I went to Cuba, which was really important. Felt like I could not authentically write about this culture if I didn't show up there and really just kind of sit in the culture and talk to people. And uh, so that was really important as well. But the, both those sides were such different worlds that I, it was almost like researching two different books, really, to have both of those perspectives feel really accurate. Was connecting those two different worlds uh, that had to be a lot of fun as a writer getting, you know, finding the place where these two worlds collide. It was I do. And that is what I do love about writing just in general is like what what sort of rabbit holes you get to go down <laughs> that you didn't really expect. And then you just sort of start unearthing all of this information that you would never otherwise discover or um, put together. So it was really fun to do that. And, you know, having her be Cuban in Hollywood, too was interesting. And I, you know, I tried to get out of Nina when I was interviewing her. Um, 
any kind of negativity her mom felt in the Hollywood world, either as a woman or um, as a Cuban, any sort of racist stuff she felt. And Nina has no, it was all just a very happy world in her, (laughs) that she didn't experience any of that stuff really. Like she was just happy to be who she was. She was successful. She had the roles that she was cast as, and she was pleased with them. Like I, at the time it was so accepted that this was what she had to step into that she, she accepted it wholeheartedly and didn't try or want for anything other than she had in that world. So I found that really interesting. That it, that's very interesting. Um, were there, were there things other than that, um, that surprised you when you started digging into uh, her story or just the, the circumstances of the time in general that, that, that readers might find interesting? You know, the most surprising thing that I could never quite figure out was, um, Estelita had, how there were seven of them. There were seven siblings, uh, two brothers and three sisters. Uh, wait, that'd be six. How many were there? Were there seven or six? I've forgotten now. <laughs> she had four <laughs> sisters, two brothers. So there were six of them. Um, and her mom left them all. Like this part of the story just amazed me. And I could never quite figure out why Estelita was like the golden child. She was the, one of the middle children. And when she was 15, her mother left Cuba with her and came to the United States and was with her from then on all the way up through her whole life and lived with her, moved with her, was there when she married. Whatever husband she was on, you know, was there part of huge part of Nina's life. Um, The fact that she just left all of her other children and her husband behind has always just been really surprising to me. Um, and they never got a divorce and there was no talk of like, she's not like leaving her husband. They were married, but she just <laughs> left Cuba and never went, I mean, they went back to visit a few times. And one of the times is when they got put in house arrest. But, um, I just thought that was wow. really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Find Me in Havana is available everywhere. Now you can get it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook. However you like to consume books, you can grab it today. There's going to be uh, links to uh, all of those ways in the show notes of this episode. Um, Serena, have you have you listened to the audiobook yet? No, but I really want to. <laughs> it's on my list of to dos. I I love it. What what do you think in general about about audiobooks and having your work translated into that uh, medium? Uh, I love that question because I feel like I don't hear authors answer that one. I actually find it kind of hard to listen to. Or I found my first one hard to listen to. I think that it's because I have such an idea of what it sounds like in my own head. Yeah. That to hear different, I hear like, oh, that's not how she'd say that line. And I'm probably (laughs) a little bit snotty because I'm also an actor. And so I don't, of course, it's up to their interpretation. So I must leave it to them. But I actually find it a little bit tricky to, to feel okay about sort of letting someone else take your words and make them their own, but they do great jobs. People love, like I, I got into the, the girls with no names. uh, Oh no, sorry. That one. Wait. And I can't remember which one had, yeah, the girls with no names is one that had the audio book. My first book does not have an audio book. Um, it's also this new way. I'm not sure. I love it to be completely honest with you where they have multiple actors reading the parts. Yeah. So that each chapter switches. So my first book has three different characters characters and they're three different women reading the parts. I personally don't love that. I find it jarring to switch between totally different voices. Um, and then yeah, it's also- I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I like one yeah. narrator and, and if they want to morph into character, okay. And, and I, I'm actually okay with them, you know, just kind of reading it straight. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, I, I'm kind of with you on that. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, of the, the cast. Yeah, me either. And the other thing that happens, which I never occurred to me until I started listening to it, is obviously when it's someone else's chapter, they're reading the voice of the other person, but now it's in their voice. Does that right. make it clear? Does <laughs> that might be yeah. making sense? And I always find that it throws me off. Like, oh, we're hearing this author, um, this actor's voice, yeah. and then it's a completely different voice reading. I, I just find it to be kind of confusing. Well, so I didn't... Well, as- yeah. Well, as the author, you obviously made it clear who the character is that we're hearing. So we we sh- technically shouldn't need a different narrator for that. Yeah, but, I think yeah. it's just a style and it's gotten to be very popular. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, obviously, someone out there is liking it because they're, yeah. they're still doing it. So they didn't ask you know, your or my opinion about it. 
Yeah. And so this, although Finding Havana, I think that I might enjoy that. I'm going to listen to it because I know that the, I, it was very important to me that the woman who reads Estelita's voice has a, an accent. Um, and so that woman does. And they do let me, it's pretty fun at the beginning. They, they let me kind of listen. I get choices. I got like five different choices. I could like listen and pick my top actors I liked the best. Um, so that's always a fun process. Uh, so I've been, in, I've been intrigued to hear uh, what that sounds like to have the mom read with an accent. And then the daughter is obviously very American and she's an American accent. So that might be kind of fun to have that difference. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna give it a listen uh, this week as well. I, I I read the book, so I'm I'm really interested to to see how that uh, how the how the audio uh, presentation of it turns out. It's gonna be amazing, I think. No, oh, thank you. So find me in Havana. Everyone, go grab it today. There are links in the show notes. Um, Serena, if if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Yes, I have a website. It's just serenaburdick.com, but I also I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and it's all just Serena Burdick. It's very easy. Excellent. We'll put links to all those uh, to make it easy for folks to find you as well. Uh, Serena, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, Hank, thanks so much. It's been lovely talking. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical, yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. The Bad Company Complete Series Omnibus, Books 1 through 7. Humanity's Greatest Export, Justice. Space is a dangerous place, even for the wary, especially for the unprepared. The aliens have no idea. Here comes The Bad Company. The Bad Company, Book 1, Colonel Terry Henry Walton, takes his warriors into battle for a price in this first installment of The Bad Company. He believes in the moral high ground and is happy to get paid for his role in securing it. Set in the Cutharian Gambit universe, Terry, Char, and their people humans, werewolves, were tigers, and vampires form the core of the Bad Company's direct action branch, a private conflict solution enterprise. Join them as they fight their way across Tissakinan 4, where none of the warring parties were what they expected. The seven-book series Omnibus includes The Bad Company, Blockade, Price of Freedom, Liberation, Destroyer, Discovery, Overwhelming Force. Grab the complete Bad Company series by Craig Martell now. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Anderley. Virtutus Gloria Mercis. Translation, Glory is the Reward of Valor. Fed up with playing the normal game, recent university graduate, ex cum laude, ex soccer star, ex popular and mostly broke Cara Madonna changes her life when she decides to research how to be a witch and believes it. Cara didn't want to go back east and deal with her overbearing mom, so when university was done, she stayed behind in Los Angeles. Little did she realize how controlling moms can be from the other side of the country. Feeling a little desperate to make her own way, she buys a few books on business and one on a lark, How to Be a Badass Witch. That's when the trouble started. Find out just what trouble a young woman can get into when the magic just might be real. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Andrews.